Welcome to Delaware Healthcare Reality, a podcast presentation of the Medical Society of Delaware with Dr. Nicholas Biasato. Dr. Biasato is board certified in family medicine, and he has extensive experience and training in treating patients with addiction and substance abuse. Now, let's join Dr. Nick Biasato for Delaware Healthcare Reality. Welcome. I'm Dr. Nick Biasato, your host of the Medical Society of Delaware podcast, Delaware Healthcare Reality. Before we go into our guest, I would like to give a little brief bio of myself. I'm a primary care physician working out of Newark, Delaware. I am former president of the Medical Society from 2008 to 2010. I am presently the president of the Newcastle County Physician Organization. I'm also the chairman of the pharmacy committee dealing with pharmacy issues between doctors and pharmacists. And I'm also um, chairman of the third party payer committee dealing with issues between the insurance companies and physicians. Why a podcast? First off, I think a podcast should be informative to doctors and patients in Delaware. Many informational things come to us by, by faxes, blast faxes from the medical society on a weekly basis. But a lot of us don't look at it. A lot of us don't read it. The staff usually throws it away. So I think this podcast may be an easier way for us to um, get that information across to you because much of it is important about legislative issues as well as, well as payer issues that doctors might want to know. I want it to be educational. I intend to bring on local specialists in the near future to discuss their medical specialty, uh, dealing with uh, advances in medicine and possibly controversial issues also. Uh, Stay tuned for those. They're going to be very good. I would also like to encourage engagement and participation. With more involvement in our medical societies, both state, the Medical Society of Delaware, and national, the AMA and the AOA, the more physicians control their profession and protect their patients' rights. We can direct their care as it should be. The doctor-patient relationship should exist without interference from outside sources such as payers and or government. Now, how to access our podcast? At present, our pre-recorded podcast will be on the MSD website. Our website is www.medicalsocietyofdelaware.org. You will be able to enter this podcast or listen to it without a password. In the future, I said I will be hosting local specialists uh, to discuss patient care. Our guest is Mr. Mark Thompson, our executive director. Mark, welcome. Tell us a little about yourself, how you came to be an executive director, your credentials, your educational history, a little about your personal life and journey to your present position. Hey, thank you, Dr. Biasato. It's an honor to be your guest on your your inaugural podcast. So, oh, so oh, thank you very me, much. You're going to make me blush. So, absolutely. So, no. Well, first off, how much time do I have? Because uh, I have over 30 years in healthcare administration. Take yeah. your time. Let's just have a conversation. Yep. Yeah. So, anyway, so I guess the the biggest thing in my background is I get this naturally working with physicians and working in healthcare. My father was a surgeon. My mom was a nurse. Uh, which I'm also living proof that doctors and nurses can actually get along quite well. And also, uh, the issues that we talked about around our dinner table, ironically, are the very same issues that are being addressed in healthcare today. So my entire academic career, my entire professional career has been involved in in healthcare. Um, Undergraduate work was done at Duke University. Um, I have my master's in health services administration from the George Washington University in in D.C. Um, I have a background working in hospitals, both in academic university medical centers, as well as in community-based hospital settings. It was uh, approximately 13 years ago that I had an opportunity to come to the Medical Society of Delaware and in serving as in the capacity of the external affairs officer. And it was to help with marketing, public relations, uh, strategic initiatives, working with the General Assembly, working with the business community and other key stakeholders here in here in Delaware. And uh, then approximately almost seven years ago, uh, my predecessor announced his retirement and I was encouraged to put my hat into the ring uh, for the executive director's job. And I'm honored and pleased to say that 
that it stuck. So I really have had the great pleasure of representing the physicians across the state of Delaware over, over these past six or seven years. In terms of a little bit about me personally, I guess probably my, one of my best and greatest accomplishments there is I'm a, a proud dad of two beautiful daughters. And um, so Emily and Caitlin. So there, that, that's a big, big thing to know about me personally. Well, there's a couple of weddings you got to pay for. Colleges and cars too. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That was very interesting, and I appreciate it. We're glad to have you here as our leader too. All right, now let's describe a little bit about the medical society. Many people don't know what we do; they don't know how we do it. Uh, as you know, we have a non-profitable arm as well as a profitable arm. arm. Can, you, can you discuss that? Yes, sir, absolutely. So the Medical Society is an incredibly dynamic and robust organization. And I think you're right. Many people don't really comprehend all the work that we do on behalf of the physicians and the patients here in, in the state of Delaware. You're right. We, we are a, a non-profit organization. Uh, we are 501c6 as a medical society. However, within that, uh, we do have two nonprofit foundations, two 501c3s, one being the Delaware Foundation for Medical Services, and the other one being the Delaware Medical Education Foundation. And both of them, their names are exactly what they are, what they, what they services and opportunities that they help to fund for physicians and others in the community. We do have three for-profit entities in the Medical Society. The first one being the Medical Society of Delaware Insurance Services, which is a wholly owned insurance subsidiary here in Delaware. It started out a number of years ago just in the capacity of helping with um, liability coverage because there was uh, one of the, 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 pretty much the loan carrier at that time had pulled out of the state and the physicians were in real need of access to coverage. Uh, we worked with a local firm at that point in time. It was the Zutz Agency in Wilmington. And that has now grown today to we are now powered by USI, which happens to be one of the world's largest insurance brokerages. And it's gone well beyond just basic liability coverage. Um, it also provides personal lines. It provides uh, benefits for practices. So it really has whatever anybody would need. And now they're even launching new services available to members and office staffs, which include travel insurance. Uh, they're working, believe it or not, through pet insurance <laughs> opportunities. And even along the lines of uh, help with the student loan repayment options. Right. So that's a, that's a great uh, entity within the medical society. Another one is... Tell us, tell us how you access MS. Uh, MSDIS. So MSDIS. So you can you can get that again if you go to our website, mm -hmm. which again is Medical Society of Delaware org. There is a there's a banner right there on the home page, and that will take you right to the contact folks with with uh, with MSDIS. Very and good. So very good. Right, uh, a second f uh, entity among, among the for profits is a group called MedNet, and that was set up again. Oh, probably close to 30 years ago, and it was designed to help those who are in independent practice uh, be able to contract. So whether it's commercial plans, Medicaid plans, but there's a structure that then underneath it, it, it helps to contract for four different physician organizations across the state of Delaware. And so um, I'm really proud to say that, that that has now grown. There are well over 800 physicians and, and other uh, non-physician non clinicians in that uh, network of, and of, uh, of folks across the state. And again, we have contracts to support those doctors in Medicaid and in, and in other areas to support their patients. So the more numbers, the, the better negoti negotiation power. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And then the, the third uh, for-profit entity is a group called Health Hub. And that was started out originally when electronic health records and, and electronic medical records were coming online. And no one really knew, you know, which group was legitimate, which one wasn't. And it was a way by which the medical society could provide a good housekeeping seal of approval, if you will, for our members. And so uh, today, the adoption rate on EMRs and EHRs in Delaware is incredibly strong. 
So we now look at opportunities around telemedicine vendors, and we also provide uh, opportunities for other unique networking opportunities around technology and specifically emerging technologies for the physicians and their practices out there. So those are the, the three for-profits to go along with the nonprofit. In terms of the medical society as a whole, we also provide management services for 10 different specialty societies across the state of Delaware. We have uh, our communications is to physicians and to practice managers is, is really, uh, again, one of those dynamic uh, initiatives that we provide. We have weekly uh, newsletters that go to physicians, weekly uh, newsletters that go to practice managers. Um, so the, during the pandemic, we opened up those communications to every physician in the state. And I know that they found it to be beneficial. The Division of Public Health and other officials in the state found it to be incredibly beneficial because with everything changing, uh, literally on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, to have access to critical information was, was vital Great. for everybody. And we were really the conduit uh, for all physicians in the state on that. Uh, we also provide uh, safety net programs uh, to patients who are high risk in the state. And particularly by that, it's for patients who they run between 139% to 200% of federal poverty level, meaning they make too much to qualify for Medicaid, but they really cannot afford insurance. Uh, these patients are also may have a waiver from participation in the Affordable Care Act. And in, and in some cases, too, because they can't get Medicaid or they can't get other coverage, many times it has to do with citizenship. And But though they are here legally and working in Delaware, um, they're able to take care of a program that, that we partner with the state of Delaware on, and it's called Healthcare Connection. And the Medical Society provides a network of physicians it's called the VIP initiative, which I believe you're, you're very well aware of and part participate, of. you're part of. And it's a network of both primary care and specialists who agreed to see these patients on a sliding scale mm -hmm. um, and because they're, they're self-pay. It's not insurance. And in some cases, we have physicians who will see these patients sometimes at no charge, depending on the situation, what's going on with the patient. That's true. So the idea was to get these patients connected really with a health home because most of them, because they didn't have a primary care doctor, they were utilizing very inappropriately the emergency room for either their primary care or they were deferring care and putting things off, putting things off, and then they became a train wreck and had to go to the emergency department for something that, that could have been avoidable. Okay. So now the idea is to get them connected with a primary care doctor, a health home, who can best manage them. The, the other side of this equation that we provide within VIP is a prescription medication assistance program. Many of these patients need uh, very expensive medications. Many of them have chronic conditions uh, and, and multiple chronic conditions at that. So we have a specialist on our staff that works with the patient and will work with uh, pharmacies in the state of Delaware that will meet or even sometimes beat Walmart's $4 uh, script program, but also the specialist will work with the pharmaceutical companies in your couponing program and to get these patients the, the, uh, the essential medications that they need so to keep, keep them well. So that's another area that we provide uh, services on. We have a physician relations program uh, that is really physician, combined with physician relations and professional education. Uh, we are nationally accredited to provide Category 1 CMEs for physicians uh, anywhere in the country, but we do that, of course, here in Delaware. Um, but the physicians will call whether they are in independent practice or whether they're employed. They'll have questions about something. They'll need help with something. Um, not sure where to turn. It, it could be a legislative or regulatory matter they've got a question about. It could be they've got a human resources question. They've got a regulatory item they want to talk about. And we have specialists right. in, in those areas as well. But in speaking of the legislative and regulatory area, uh, 
probably one of the greatest demands and also the greatest strengths of the medical society is our, our legislative advocacy in, initiatives. And that one is, um, I think it's a commentary of today's overzealous uh, regulatory environment that, that we live in. Mm-hmm. Um, but also it's just the amount of legislation that sometimes good, sometimes items that are not so good, or sometimes there's legislation that may someone may introduce that they may think is benign toward patients or doctors, but actually there's something in the language that would affect a physician or in their and or their patient. So we'll we'll weigh in on that. We have a government affairs committee that is made up of a diverse group of physicians from around the state, and when I say diverse, I mean it in every sense of the word. Uh, I used to chair that committee and loved it. Right, I remember working on that with mm-hmm. you when I when I first came to the to the medical society, mm-hmm. and it there is a lot of great work that's done there on behalf of the physicians and patients across the state, and you know I think uh, you know one of the things I'm really proud of is is our our ongoing um, ability to work with legislators and others uh, elected officials in the state of Delaware. Uh, that's our primary focus. Is, is the state of Delaware, but we're also no stranger to Capitol Hill in being work with our being able to work with our two senators <clears throat> and our and our member of Congress. And so, but uh, the bulk of our work is in the legislative area. Really, is in Dover and at uh, Legislative Hall. So, those are some of just the the high level areas. But you know, we also provide. Uh, some folks may remember the old Delaware Medical Journal, mm-hmm. and which was a printed journal that used to get mailed out. Well, as we all know, times change, circumstances change, uh, everything evolves. Nothing is really static or constant. So, but what we have done is we have moved to the Delaware Academic Channel, mm-hmm. and we do that uh, so if someone wants to get published. They can do it. It's in a digital platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can get uh, uh, PubMed status. These articles are peer reviewed, so it's it's a great way. So whether it's a, it's a, a, a med student, a resident, uh, someone who's doing active research in the state, someone who wants to get published, it's a phenomenal way to do that. Mm-hmm. And rather than being in a uh, a print journal that was distributed pretty much in Delaware. Now, because it's it, the power of the internet and its digital footprint, it goes everywhere. So, the the you can be seen pretty much everywhere and anywhere now, yeah. and, and your articles be published. So, you can tell that there is. I could go on and on oh, and yes, on. Yes, you could. I know. But but the bottom line is, we are we're a physician led organization. We have a number of committees on varieties of subjects that are comprised of our physicians. I'm pleased to say that we, we have an outstanding staff here at the Medical Society that supports those different committees. Um, that's how our policy gets made. That's how our, our uh, procedures are determined. Uh, that work through our executive board and our council, which is our ultimate governing body. But uh, and again, we represent whether it's uh, physicians who are employed or in, in independent practice. Um, and we have approximately 1,300 members of the Medical Society. We're always looking to, to continue to try to grow that, but that includes retirees. Uh, it also includes residents and, but, and other physicians and physicians across the state. So the, that's, that's a, that's a it believe it or not, that's a high-level overview of, of how dynamic the Medical Society is. It, worth every penny of its dues by... by any stretch of the imagination. Right. And, I, and I kind of feel bad because I probably omitted something. And That's I, okay. That's sorry okay. if I did. The Medical Society does a lot of good work for the patients and physicians of Delaware. That is what the, top, that is what the, the point is here. And that you know, it's, a, it's worth every cent. Okay. Now, Mark, would you please speak to the grant from Highmark to help our primary care with essential needs to stay afloat in this financially difficult time? As you know, many of our primary care doctors are really struggling because reimbursement is not good to them. Some of them are retiring early and some of them are going to work for another hospital or some of them are in a large group. Can you tell us what Highmark did for us to help us in this issue? Sure, absolutely. So this was all really born out of, like you said, the 
the desire, the need to improve access to care for Delawareans to, to primary care. Uh, like many states, Delaware has a, a workforce shortage of physicians and, and specifically to that of, of primary care. Um, there is there was legislation that was passed a few years ago to help to support primary care physicians and to try to help with reimbursement. Uh, the reimbursement, again, is not everything, but it's critical because to the, in today's day and age, with uh, as Medicare continues to cut physician reimbursement rates and the rate of inflation, so it's another hit on a, on a, on a physician um, who's trying to meet payroll, who's trying to hire adequate staff, uh, try to meet the needs of their patients. The adequate reimbursement for them is critical just, to, again, to provide basic access to care mm -hmm. for, for Delawareans. And this has been a strategic, well-known priority for the Medical Society in our legislative endeavors and as well as fundraising endeavors. And we were able to work with Highmark's philanthropic entity called Blueprints mm -hmm. is actually where the grant has come from. So to secure a, a grant totaling $4.25 million over four years where it's being dispersed in $1 million increments. So we're in our second year of that. So to date, we've received $2 million thanks to the generosity of, of Blueprints and Highmark uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Delaware. And the initiative is to support those who are in independent practice with help with um, where they'll have needs for enhancing their electronic medical record system. If they want to augment or add telemedicine to their, uh, to their practice, if they need to make uh, physical improvements to the, to the actual office, mm -hmm. uh, that, that too is, is important. Um, but also if they need to hire staff, if they need to hire another physician, if they need to hire care coordinators, PAs, nurses, funds are available there for them for that. They also have access through these funds. They can talk to a grant writer to see if they, the practice, wants to try to pursue other grants that are out there mm -hmm. to, to help them. So this has really been a significant benefit to, to the physicians who are out there. And there is an application process because we are good stewards with that grant money. Uh, we, we do account for every bit of it. And so it's, uh, it really has been incredibly beneficial to help those practices, like you said, who are trying to keep their head above water, those practices who may have thought about closing, some thought about maybe retiring early, leaving the state, that's what I was talking about. The, we need to continue to do things like this to help to maintain access to care for people. I personally have taken advantage of this because I knew about it, but a lot of physicians did not. So the word is going to get out through this podcast and through other communications that this is available in the application for next year. Come and get it. You know, see what you can get. And hi, Mark, we appreciate the help. Right. Mm -hmm. Really. And, it, and, it, and it really is, uh, it's an outstanding program. program, and I can't say enough good things about Blueprints and their, and their generosity in this. Mm -hmm. um, again, we do, we do provide, uh, we do reporting, we do ask the practices to give us information how they're spending the dollars, and we do report that back to, to Blueprints. So like I said, we're, it's, it's our intention that we will be good stewards of those financial resources. I fully understand that. My last question to you, Mark. You represent us at the AMA annual meetings, as does six physicians, of whom I am one. Briefly tell us what was discussed and accomplished at the interim meeting in Washington, D.C. a couple months ago. You can give a brief overview, as I've already asked Dr. Vera Papa to comment on that, and he will do that in our next podcast. So okay. go ahead. What did you take from it? Great. Well, one thing, you know, so I have... Again, this is a, an opportunity and a great pleasure that I have to, to represent the physicians in, in Delaware. And by going to the AMA meetings, there's, a, there's an annual meeting in June in Chicago, the home of the AMA. And then there's an interim meeting always in November. And the, the locations on that, that rotate. But, you know, it, 
I have, from first off, from my standpoint as the executive director, um, and not being a physician, but my role in a lot of that, those meetings, are to provide counsel and context to our physician members, our delegation that attends those meetings. Um, there may may need there may need to be clarity or context about what some of our policies are here, what some of the policies are within the AMA. So I help in that con, con, context and counsel type role, if you will. But while I'm also at these meetings, I have the, uh, the opportunity to meet with AMA's executive leadership, um, and th there we have an opportunity to uh, explain what's going on here in our local market in our, in our state. We hear really what's going on at a more granular level uh, with the AMA and their initiatives. So that's also a benefit which I, I bring back and, and share with, with physicians in the state. Um, I also serve on the, the AMA has a litigation center and a lot of folks don't know about this. Um, and this is one of the uh, breakouts from, from the big meeting itself. But the, the lit I serve on the AMA's executive committee of the litigation center. And everyone knows about the AMA's outstanding policy and lobbying work at, at the federal level and their work to try to, to help on the regulatory side of things. But I don't think folks really comprehend or really know enough about the AMA's litigation power and the, the resources that are there. On, on the legal side of equations. If, whether it's a, an issue to defend a physician, groups of physicians, uh, or if a, if a physician actually wish to bring forth a lawsuit, uh, whether it be an individual or a larger scale. I'll give you just a, a, some of the, uh, an idea of some of the cases that, that we review. Uh, we will recommend budgeting uh, and finances for um, for certain lawsuits, whether we decide the AMA should participate and get involved in some of these, these cases. Uh, the AMA will also provide to the litigation center support at a local level. Mm -hmm. So meaning if a state medical society uh, invites the AMA litigation center to come in and provide uh, support for briefs, legal fees, uh, and more, the AMA will do that on behalf of whether it's the State Medical Society, physicians who ask. But some of the, a lot of the cases that we've addressed uh, throughout my time on, on that executive committee have been, of course, professional liability issues, mm -hmm. scope of practice, uh, things around the Affordable Care Act protections, peer review confidentiality, uh, managed care abuses, thing, uh, cases involving the No Surprises Act, medical staff privileges is also a big one. Uh, legal cases that address anti-tobacco, uh, as well as regulations out there around flavored electronic nicotine delivery systems. Believe it or not, that that's still mm. pretty pretty prevalent. And then um, uh, also firearm violations. So there is it's a there's a we cover a lot of of cases that we decide to provide support for, but. It, the, the meeting I always find, whether it be the uh, interim or whether it be the annual meeting, the the work, the resolution that the uh, AMA's House of Delegates does to to advance the practice of medicine mm -hmm. is I think is is phenomenal. And again, they, they take on big issues this year at the meeting. Two two really big ones was fix Medicare. And, it, and quit with the reductions, yeah. which has been ongoing for a number of years. Right. And the other one is prior authorization mm. reform. And then, of course, workforce development issues and scope of practice. Got so there, it, it, uh, all these issues, and the AMA is really, really big, as the medical society is, on issues that really they all lead toward physician burnout and fatigue. Correct. These items are quantifiable. Mm -hmm. there, there, it's, there's no denying that. And so all the issues that took place at that meeting are really involving those items that help to lead toward, you know, that unfortunately 
the high rate of fatigue and burnout. It, it's it's tragic, and which kind of you know we we come back from those meetings, but also I would be remiss if I didn't mention that at the state level through the Medical Society of Delaware that we just finished our our own strategic plan. Uh, we just did, did a lot of work on that, uh, a committee involving physicians, mm -hmm. practice managers, community leaders, mm -hmm. uh, where ultimately it's, it's a three-year plan. Folks probably remember back in the day, they would do a five- and ten-year strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, no that's way. That doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, yeah. So you, you now have even three-year is kind of stretching it, but um, – our strategic plan will focus on on four key areas, which membership engagement. Um, we're committed to being the physician advocate. Uh, we're committed toward a healthier Delaware, and also maintaining that organizational vitality mm -hmm. that is the Medical Society of Delaware. Very good, very good. In in one more area that I want to mention about the work of the Medical Society of Delaware is uh, just a few years ago, actually, ironically enough, right at the start of the pandemic, we launched a, a mission appeal, uh, an annual appeal to help our, our educational programs, to help support our, our outreach medical programs. Uh, the funds for these, appeal, for these appeals go to our two foundations, to the Delaware Foundation for Medical Services or the Delaware Medical Education Foundation. And through the generosity of physicians in this state and through a few foundations, and um, we have to date raised over $2.2 .2 million. Wow. Yeah, if, if not more. So um, that's a, a, a ballpark number, but mm -hmm. it's, uh, it is something that is, we're still growing. Mm -hmm. We're gonna to continue to work with foundations around the state, mm -hmm. but it, it is a way in which to support our staff, to support the physicians, and to help these, these core programs that we provide, whether it be community-based education, uh, professional-based education, uh, or medical outreach. I remember in my, when I went to the annual meeting of the AMA, my head exploded with all the information that went into it and <laughs> went out of it. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I would like to say that you had some big shoes to fill with your predecessor, from your predecessor, Mark Meister, and you have done that so very, very well. I hope you enjoyed the discussions and stay tuned as we grow. You will love our show. This has been Delaware Healthcare Reality, a podcast presentation of the Medical Society of Delaware. For more information about MSD, visit our website, medicalsocietyofdelaware.org, for questions or suggestions regarding our podcast, email us at healthcare.reality at Thanks to audionautics.com for our music. Delaware Healthcare Reality is produced by Tom Mitten. I'm Laurieann Rhodes. Watch for our next podcast episode. Until then, be well. The Medical Society of Delaware, MSD, is providing this podcast for informational purposes only. It provides neither medical, legal, nor any other professional advice. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by the host or any guests are their own and do not reflect the views or policies of MSD. Unless specifically stated, reference to any specific product, service, or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by MSD. Reliance on the information provided in this podcast is exclusively at the risk of the listener. MSD expressly disclaims any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of, reference to, or reliance on this podcast or the information presented in this podcast. Mm -hmm.